we will get there. So I'm hoping that you all want to be data scientists. And I'm going to take you through kind of how you become to do that using an approach that I think kind of helps wrap your head around what this actually is. But first, I want to start with a quote. Um, I was working at Microsoft just until recently, and I saw this quote and I was like, oh man, this is an awesome quote from my friends Google. I keep saying the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statisticians. People think I'm joking, but who would have guessed that computer engineers would have been the sexy job of the 19, 1990s? I don't think anybody. I really don't, I really don't think that people were like, yeah, I'm gonna be, instead of, instead of all of these really amazing finance jobs or world traveling management consulting, no, I'm gonna throw all that away, I'm gonna go code. I don't think that was an idea people were having. But myself, as well as people way more educated and smarter than I am, are saying that now it's going to be statisticians. It's gonna be, what do we do with this data? What can we unlock with it? So with that being said, let's talk about the who, what, when, where, and why of data science. We'll start with just talking about what is data science. So data science kind of has three bubbles. And you might have seen this graph before. There's tons of them everywhere. Some have five, some have six, some have three. I like this one, keeps it pretty simple. Um, a data scientist has kind of a perfect combination of three different skills. They're, first off, they have hacking skills. They have maths and statistics and knowledge skills. And they also have expertise in their industry. Um, this is important because, as you can see in kind of these different bubbles, if you don't have all three of these, you kind of fall into somewhere in between, some sort of gap. Um, having a lot of expertise, but not having a lot of hack, or, and not having a lot of math and statistics and knowledge, you're going to be able to build and hack together really cool models that might not be accurate. Um, similar if you have hacking skills and math, math and statistics and knowledge, you'll come out and you'll be like, yeah, we've got this awesome model, and you'll go and take it to the business, and the business will say, what does it solve for? And you'll be solving for something that's not even a problem in the business world. Um, great that you were able to solve it, uh, just the application's not quite there. So data scientists, in data science itself, is kind of a combination of all these, all these different skills. Andrew, quick question. Mm -hmm. What the heck is the hacking skill of the programming? What do you mean by hacking skills? Mostly programming. It's mostly just curiosity. When I say hacking, um, yes, it's like more based in the, the computer realm, but you want to be curious, you want to be able to take new frameworks, you want to kind of push the edge on things, you want to be willing to, to hack on them, which means that you want to build and you want to move things forward instead of just maybe taking what's already there. So there's a nice arrow coming together. You have the statistics and computer science. So that's kind of the idea of where those three things live is in between statistics and computer science. So you can either be a statistician coming down and learning computer science, or you can be a computer scientist coming up and learning statistics, and both of those should get you into an area where you can start learning about data science and machine learning. So these merge together, you have two different ways that you can come at this. I came at it from more of the computer science realm. Um, I had studied industrial engineering in the University of Michigan, did a lot of programming, a little bit of business and statistics. So I kind of got lucky right in that sweet spot of like knowing some stats, knowing some programming, being able to combine both those together um, to help uh, companies come up with different models. And I'll give some examples of kind of what I've done with those companies and how that's related with data science as we go along through this. How do we get to the term data science? Why aren't we just calling this statistics? And what's the difference? We have these three people, Peter Noir, Gregory Piatsky, and Jeff Wu. These three people have kind of pioneered data science. And when you think of it, it's not, a, it's not, it's not something that's been around for a long time. Even the term itself um, had only been around from about 1997 on. So Peter Noir, he started talking about data science um, back in uh, when he was talking about different concepts and terms in data processing, it started to come out and he started saying that there was a science around how you process data. So he kind of has the first idea of like there's data, there's science, we're bringing these together to find out what happens um, in our models. Then you had Greg, who actually in, in 1989, he organized the first workshop 
on knowledge discovery and data. So kind of taking that a step further, starting to build workshops and community around it. And then actually the term itself, um, Mr. Wu in 1997, as he was giving his uh, lecture for appointment into uh, the professorship of the University of Michigan, go blue, he, he actually coined the term, he called it data science and advocated. He was so, he was so jazzed up about this, was so excited. He was like, we don't need statistics. Get rid of this. We're gonna call everything data science. And we're not there yet, but I think that we should be eventually getting towards into data science. And if you look at curriculum in schools, data science is being taught in both statistics and in computer science. They're both starting to bleed over a little bit because you need one and you need the other to come out and be able to solve these problems afterwards. Andrew, are you mm -hmm. for use cases? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll get to that towards the end. Um, we're just talking about kind of what, what it is and the term itself and where it came from. And now we're going to talk about like who is a data scientist, right? Where do these, where do these data scientists live? You know, obviously they're drinking past PBR, they're, they're looking like a, a hipster, are they up in the mission? Where, where are they living and, and who are they, right? Well, a lot of them look like this. Tired, overworked. <laughs> And this is Nate Silver, by the way. Uh, has anybody heard of Nate Silver? Yeah, he's super famous for the 538 blog and his predictions for elections. Uh, but he's done predictions about everything. And he's actually a stat statistician, um, but believes in um, data science. His quote is actually that data science is just a sexy word for statistician. Um, so that's what he does, super famous. Um, and, and kind of who that data scientist is. I also believe that, that anyone can kind of be a data scientist if they have the right tools and they get the right, um, kind, of, kind of understand how to classify different problems to fit a data science framework, the framework that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit here. But a data scientist is also gonna need a lot of skills. So some of the skills they need, these mad skills, um, this goes back to when we were talking about what are hacking skills. They have to have technical skills. So um, I heard that you guys had uh, someone come in here and talk about R beforehand. Uh, that's kind of the academic, the statistical way. A lot of people are using R, coming in, using MATLAB, all these R packages to build up and uh, build these machine learning models. Uh, but this is all based on a fundamental computer science understanding, right? Um, you also need to know Python. If you're coming from a computer science background, I see a lot of people now. Um, coming in, looking at Python first. I get, I get asked this all the time. Andrew, I'm busy. I only have time to learn one more language. I'm working with JavaScript. There's a million different packages. I don't know what to do, but I want to learn data science. I have one more language I can fit in my brain. And I recommend for them to typically look at Python first. Um, because it's kind of where everything's going. It's a, it's a more powerful language than something like R. Um, there's more computer scientists using um, Python than there are R. R is more statistical. And if you're coming from a place where you have a lot of programming background, getting started with Python is, is kind of the right way to go. Um, you need to understand something about clouds, and you have to be able to get to all this data. This data isn't good for anything if it's just trapped away in a database, right? So one of the things that I think is really important is being able to have the skills to get it from the database and get it in the shape of which you are going to use for the machine learning algorithm. And a funny story about that is I was actually working um, with a large insurance company. And we were trying to help them reduce the number of insurance claims they had by installing an IoT device. And I was there with like a huge team of data scientists. I say huge, it was like three of them, but that's a lot for uh, any one project particularly. Uh, for the period of time we were looking at. And we actually spent about 80% of our time digging through the data, understanding the data, getting it in a format that fit for what we were trying to solve for. And uh, it, was, it was one of my first projects working with data scientists and just realizing how much of that work was just pulling from databases, getting it in the right format, building the right features, which I'll explain in a second, and, and pulling that out into that final model. It took a lot of time, so having that, that type of skill is good. We also use MapReduce in that, in that, uh, in that context. Uh, 
We were talking about tap when, when Dave was up here, saying it ran on Spark. So that's all going to be using MapReduce, maybe through Pi or something like that. So having the, that knowledge is also really good and helpful to troubleshoot when things go wrong, or if you need more processing power, or you're just working with too much data. Having the skills to be able to use a distributed framework like MapReduce is really helpful. So that's the technical side. You also need to understand some statistics, uh, machine learning. So I don't know if you guys had to talk about machine learning too recently. Data science is just the is just kind of machine learning is a fundamental of data science. As you have one model here, one model here, data science kind of brings all of those together and gets you to an answer. Um, an example of that is you might have a multiple machine learning models for one data science problem. So maybe you're looking at like a linear programming problem and you're trying to figure out how much to order for Chipotle. I love Chipotle. So let's talk about Chipotle. Chipotle has this problem. They're trying to figure out how much of cheese, lettuce, tomato to order. Right? They, in order to solve that problem, they have to know how many people are coming to Chipotle to buy burritos. And they might need to know how many, how, what the price for those burritos are and how all of those things interconnect because each one of those is intertwined and you might have a model for predicting price, a model for predicting ordering lettuce, a model for predicting number of customers, but it all gets to that kind of overarching idea of like how do we run a Chipotle so that it's efficient and we do the right things at the right times and the right quantities. So data science kind of is an umbrella term that fits over what all of that means. I hope I didn't go too far off that. Also need to know how to design experiments, because you're not going to have statistically sound experiments if you're not designing them correctly. And then you have to learn a little bit about algorithms. Um, so this is where a statistician and myself might just differ a little bit, is a statistician is going to say you need to understand each and every regression and what's happening under the covers to even get started. And I'm going to say that you need to be able to understand what a regression algorithm is or a problem looks like clustering problem or a recommendation problem. And I guarantee you guys know right now what a recommendation engine looks like. Amazon has been using them on me forever. And they typically work. So those are the kind of skills. You gotta have those mad skills. You also have to have mad smarts, right? Um, as we start talking about communication and visualization, it's super important. That same one I was telling you about, uh, about claims when I was working with that large insurance company, trying to reduce those claims. The team of data scientists I was working with um, frequently would find something very interesting in the data. They'd be all excited, like, yeah, we found something. It's seven. What is seven? Yeah, it's seven. They were just telling me, seven, seven, seven. And I was like, okay, I understand it's seven, but like, what does that mean? And comes to find out that like, when they were able to categorize a claim as a claim bucket seven, that meant that they could have predicted that it, they could have they had a good chance of stopping that claim from happening with an IoT device. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that? So being able to wrap that story around and have an idea of, of what it's actually solving and not just putting a number out there and being able to explain it to other people, great data scientists really have that skill. And that might be told not only from the story you're telling and the business context that you use, but also through the visualization that you do. Um, so we had to showcase how those different clusters of groups, of claims, what those look like. So we had to do that using a bunch of visualization tools. Um, we use things like Excel, we use different R packages with word clouds, and uh, a number of, I think we used Tableau in that case as well, to be able to figure out what that looks like. Um, the other thing that data scientists needs to do, and that comes down to the storytelling, is be able to talk with senior management, and also be able to talk with developers. Because a lot of times the data that they're getting is locked in some development group, and you need to go and talk to those developers. And what's the fastest way to talk to a developer? You speak the same language, right? Someone comes to you and says, hey, I need this, this specification. So much easier to serve that up to them via an API than if they're like, hey, I need the data. But if they're able to speak your language and you're able to speak both on that side, it makes it much easier. Same with business. You need this business intuition. Now that we're over there. This could be the data scientist, or this could be someone else in the team sometimes, depending on how well you're working together and how closely. 
But uh, really great data scientists, they have this intuition on where to go and look at and what to look for and where to go. This is that, that circle around business, right? They're gonna be a subject matter expert in something. They're gonna be curious about the data. And they're gonna be able to influence others because a lot of times they're gonna have to go to those developer groups. They're gonna have to say, hey, I, I need access to your data. And that developer's gonna be like, hmm, you're not my boss. I'm supposed to be working on this. See this feature list? Those are all mine. You're not on this list. So sometimes that data scientist has to go and ask for help when, when needed so that they can work within those. And so be, having the skill to be able to influence without direct authority can be really helpful. They can be a problem solver, yeah, strategic, proactive. All, all of those things are really good to, to be, be fit in there. So now back to your question when you're asking about like when do you need a data scientist? What are some examples of when you need them? Um, I think that you really need them in kind of three places. I like the term advanced analytics because there's lots of analytics and let's be honest, data science is another term, or another place where analytics are, uh, are used. So we need them for not only analyzing already collected data, but for designing new applications. Uh, the data might already exist. And yes, it makes a lot of sense for data scientists to go look at that data, but why do we need them when we're designing new applications? We need data scientists when we're designing new applications because there is a tendency not to collect the data that matters up front, and once you don't collect data, it's gone forever. So we can think about something like self-driving cars. We're trying to solve the problem with self-driving cars right now. Uh, we don't have a ton of data about how cars have been driven. Imagine if we had data science and the technology and everything else to be able to be collecting data when the Model T came out. And we had data for 100 plus years on what cars were doing and how they were interacting. That would have been huge. But back then we weren't thinking about how do we collect this data. And I think that in some, some organizations we're not thinking about that now unless we have a data scientist coming and talking with the architects and the business um, problem solver who's decided to come in and, and ask those questions. So let's dive a little into those. When I talk about advanced analytics, here's kind of what I mean. Um, you can see that we have value, difficulty. Uh, our traditional business intelligence solutions are going to be down here. Where you're going to have descriptive analytics, um, diagnostic, kind of what happened, why did it happen, what will happen, and how can we make it happen. Um, as you can see, this is kind of a chart. It has an arrow over there, saying that you're growing into this. Super important. <clears throat> Everyone wants to know how can we make it happen? How can we make our stock price double? How can we uh, double the amount of people that are using our product? Well, you can't answer those questions until you've started to do some basic analysis, understanding kind of where we are and what already happened. So in order to be able to do that, you have to know what happened, why did it happen? What will happen? How can we make it happen? Um, and there's a lot of information out there about how traditional BI works. You know, looking in the rearview mirror a lot of time, what happened, why did it happen, and to advanced analytics, and like what will happen, and how can we make it happen? So when you're thinking about advanced analytics and problems, make sure that you've done these steps and that you don't just jump right into how can we make it happen, because that's going to give you some issues probably. So let's talk a little about analyzing collected data, something you already had, this large data stores that might be back there. Um, what does a team look like that's trying to solve those problems? I think a team looks a lot like this. Three people, you have a data engineer, a data scientist, and an API developer. So that data engineer, um, and sometimes these are all the same person, but then you really kind of have someone who's multifaceted, and it's not always going to be the case. A perfect team might have one person to, to, to focus on each piece. Your data engineer is going to do a lot of that work of getting things out of uh, so getting things out of the database, pulling things from a Hadoop cluster, pulling things from a NoSQL database, pulling things from a SQL database, getting all of that data laid out so the data scientists can come in and start to analyze that data, pick the right model, start to play with it and see how they can how accurate they can make it. But with just those two, you have the data, you've analyzed, you've got the answers, number seven, um, but how do you interact with it from there? So the interactions itself are, are a whole other piece that you have to implement, which 
is typically done by an API. So you also have the developer um, involved in that solution, right? Exposing that so that other people can use this, this model. So Andrew, when you say API developer, you're talking RESTful API? Yeah. Software as a service? Um, I mean, uh, it's like you've got all this massive data, you've got HTTP doing RESTful APIs, offering it as a service for other applications. Yeah. So yeah, typically that. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily like a software as a service. It's not always customer facing, right? Um, if you're, unless your customer is like an application. Um, but what this, what I'm, what I'm saying here is that like if you have a model that's really good at predicting things, you have to have a way to interact with that model. And most, most commonly, that's through a RESTful endpoint that says. So say you have a model for let's stick with Chipotle. Um, say you have a model for Chipotle that is predicting uh, how much lettuce to order every day. So some of these that might influence that, right, are um, how many burritos are ordered, um, what's the price of a burrito, how many burritos do we expect to be ordered tomorrow. So now those are all inputs into this model, and those inputs are going to change every day. So those inputs go into the model, and you can receive a response back from that model that says, oh, given those inputs, here's what I think you should do, yes or no. Order lettuce or don't order lettuce. Um, so in that case, it's kind of like a SaaS application, but you're you're not exposing that endpoint to the consumer itself, but to the to the application that's using it. Mm -hmm. So building new applications. I was talking a little bit about this on why with my Model T example, kind of why you need a data scientist when you're building new applications. Um, I was working with a client, a large newspaper client. And they were trying to, what's a good way to say this? They were working to make their sales force be able to sell better by using machine learning. Right? Because ideally, if you have the right data, you could know what your customers want to buy before you meet with them. Ideally. That was, their, that was what they thought was possible. Um, but we went through and we started looking at some of their, their data, their sales force data, and we realized they just weren't capturing this information. Their sales force data just had, they talked to a client, and then they sold this client. They didn't have, we talked to a client, we pitched this, we pitched this, we pitched this, we took this back, well, we put this back on. They didn't have the whole deal mapped out. So it was really hard to be able to actually solve the problem they were looking for without having that data. It was, it was pretty much impossible. But we were able to go back and recreate some of that and get them in the right track. But if they just would have had a data scientist on board in the beginning, knowing that eventually they would want to answer those problems, they would have captured different data, and the data quality would have been better, and they would have been able to actually have an even larger impact on just moving that needle. This company was huge. It's a company that, like a small 1% increase in sales from every salesperson was you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. So it was just moving that needle a small bit was able to help them, um, and they could have moved it multiple percentages had they had a little bit more data capture in the beginning. So it's important to have your data scientists there as you build these new applications. You're always going to have that kind of application architect who's going to have more of the full stack vision. Okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to use this type of framework, we're going to use React on the front end, we're going to throw it all in a, a MongoDB in the back, and, and then do those other things. But the data scientists should be in those conversations um, to help them understand, hey, what, we're going to want to know this data further down the line. And then you have the business guy who's going to be or gal who's going to just cause problems. So here's my why. Why anyone can become a data scientist. I actually kind of believe that anyone can become anything they want um, because of the democratization of knowledge. We live in a cool world right now where I can go, look something up on a search engine, read some of the most forefront papers, and not even have to get dressed. Um, few, 10, 20 years ago, that wasn't even a possibility. I was going, thumbing through uh, different cards at the library to go and find one book. You know, I, know I have a little brother and sister who are just in college. They laugh, they're like, we would never do that. Um, which, is, which is just kind of funny. So anyone can do this because there's a democratization of knowledge and it's starting to become more robust and there's things out there that help you do it. There's thousands of data science cheat sheets Tools are becoming easier and easier to use. Some of these cheat sheets, they look like, back to Chipotle. I want to know the price of something. 
Okay, follow this arrow down, this arrow down. Do you want to know the price of one object, your multiple objects, how many models do you have? And it'll actually kind of walk you through that whole flow to get you started into thinking what that problem looks like. But then anybody can become a data scientist. And why do people want to become data scientists? It's all about the money. So we can look at these, these salaries, San Francisco average, national average, data science, uh, I'm not sure how accurate these are. This is what uh, Last Door says, but I do think that the difference is pretty accurate. Um, you can see that there's a, there's a large difference between what a developer is and making and what a data scientist is making. So I think that if you can start to learn these skills, um, even if you continue to work as a developer, it's going to help you uh, tremendously within your career to be able to, to, to understand and work with these. A little bit of bonus. Let's talk a little about the how. Yeah. You had, I think it was data engineer, data scientist, and then you had API developer. So when you talk about, what do you, oh, one more. Okay. <laughs> data engineer, data scientist, you're, at, you're, you're just sort of lumping together like you can't get some of these things, right? There's actually different roles. Um, data engineer is also a term um, that you could you can find roles for data engineer. That was specifically data scientist. Um, I think that in a lot of organizations, they're asked to be the same person, uh, but I think it's a fundamentally different skill set, personally. So I'm curious what the difference parts. For example, I'm a computer scientist with a heck of a lot of statistical knowledge. Usually I had it because people aren't too interested in parties. Mm -hmm. But so I'm curious what a data engineer can do. Yeah, so. All that other stuff versus the data scientist. So data scientists are going to have more of a statistical knowledge, and a data engineer is going to have more of a data platform knowledge. So uh, a data engineer is going to be typically a DBA, a database administrator, who's taking it on themselves to learn a little bit more. They might have a big SQL background. They might know a little bit about Java because they started doing Hadoop. Um, but they might not have a full grasp yet of um, why we're using a uh, two-class boosted decision tree um, versus another algorithm, um, where the data scientist might not have a full they typically do have a, a lot of SQL background and they have a lot of this as well, but they're also going to be able to look at how to tweak those models as they come across. Yeah, you have a question too? Basically, data scientists, data engineer will make the data available for data scientists, and data scientists will train the models, create the models, and start the process, right? Yep, yep. In an ideal world, right? It never happens that way, but if, if I was to design a team, I'd look to try and make something like that happen. Um, especially because there's a a bigger need for data scientists that is able to be filled. Um, and there are many DBAs who could serve data up to a data scientist. If these two people are working together for a long period of time, their skills are going to bleed. And then you're going to have two data scientists and two data engineers that either one can fill either role, and they're going to they're work better together and have a deeper understanding. So how to become a data scientist? Let's start with some terms. Um, dig, dig back, some of you, some of you uh, just finished college, so maybe it's not so far, but we think, we think about, maybe you've heard this, independent versus dependent variables. So these are going to be important. When we talk about independent variables, nothing that the dependent variable does affects them, because they're independent. But a dependent variable, some of the things they do affect me. So we're going to be looking at a lot of dependent variables, or independent variables, which we also call features. So the example I'm going to show you, we're going to go through how to build a model for would you have survived the Titanic. A little morbid, but you know, I'm trying to keep everybody awake. So if we look at this, our dependent variable is going to be survived. Did we survive or did we not survive? Um, pretty simple. It's binary. You did or you did not. Uh, it's kind of hard to be like, you did survive, but you're also not surviving. I don't know. So it's very binary, right? But there's many things that in this Titanic have influence on that. Like your class might have influence on that. We have first class or the main class. Um, there's some cool things in this data that, that we're not going to uncover today, but as we go through, I'll talk about. Um, one of the things that is pretty interesting in the Titanic data set is that if you were in first class and you were a woman, you had a very, very high chance of um, surviving. But if you're in main class, it changes drastically in, in a different direction. Weird stuff like this in this data set, it's fascinating. And I'll show you kind of where I got this and what we can talk about that more. But I'm digressing again. 
a number of independent variables, and that whole set of those we call features. Cool? So we'll come back to that. The other piece I want to touch on before we get started is talk about these common classes of problems. Um, I taught middle school students how to do data science once. It's really fun. Um, and we just had them look at how can we find a problem and put it into a class, and then we'll find the algorithms that fit within that class. So like, let's look at classification, for example. Um, so for a classification example, we can think of um, sorry? Someone want to shout one out? Yeah, will they survive or not is another one, right? So that's classification, Titanic. Um, will they buy a burrito or not is another one. Um, when we look at regression, so that one's pretty easy. Classification doesn't have to be binary like that. It could be three things. It could be like what color car is someone going to buy. There's only a certain number of cars, so there's like a classification idea around that. Uh, if we look at a regression, um, another one, a regression problem would be an example of like what price do we want the burrito to be priced at? Because there is a um, complete range of what we could price that burrito at, right? Technically, it goes to infinity and negative infinity if, if so needed. But so that's that's an example of a regression. Recommenders again, Amazon's too too good at this. Um, you can see it on a lot of like Dell.com as well. I built one there for them. That was all based on similar similar things around recommending thing, recommending. And then anom anomaly detection. Anybody have an idea where you might, where you might use anomaly detection? Yeah, credit card fraud. Like the number one use for that is, is credit card fraud. I don't think they're very good at it because whenever I travel, they seem to turn my card off. But I still go to New York, and I don't understand how that happens so frequently. So I'm saying, if you can figure out these classes of problems, you can look at your problem and frame it in a way such that you can identify: is it a classification problem? Is it a regression? Is it a recommender? Is it an anomaly detection? You're going to be well on your way to starting to formulate how you can solve that problem. Now, this is all this is all supervised approach learning. We're not going to go into deep learning or unsupervised. So just keep that in mind as well. There's many different approaches, and I'll, I'll show through some of them as we go through here. Um, I'll add that into the demo I'm showing. Um, so when we're looking at how do we solve this, right? So we've identified it's, for example, it's a classification problem. Um, we can look at, we'll, set, we'll keep it to that Titanic, right? We're, we've realized it's a, a classification problem. We're trying to see if we'll have survived or not survived. Um, the next step is, OK, we've identified the problem. We have it's a classification. Now, do we have the data to make this problem actually work? Do we have anything related to decision? In this case, that small data I put up there, we did. This happened in the past. So you know that you have everything that's related to decision, all the historical data. You can see all this information about passengers, and you can actually see who survived and who did not. Now, we don't really have a, this is, this is a, a past model, a practice model, right? Because there's no Titanic now that's going to go and sink in the future. So you can't really use this model in real life, but we can hold back some data, and we can test to see how accurate we are. So you have to have outcomes. The biggest thing is you have to have um, your dependent variable, along with your features, um, some historical data to be able to understand and have your model learn. Basically, you can think of that as like your model is a person. Um, if you were going to tell a person to do something the first time, and they had nothing to base that upon, they're probably not going to be very good at it. But the more times they've done it in the past, a professional athlete, for example, the more times they've caught the football or they've scored a goal, they, the more they know where to be in the right position and how to do that, just like a model. The more data you can feed in typically, or the better quality data, the more accurate it's going to be. It's just to remember that the model on the back end is just an algorithm. Right? We're giving it a bunch of training step representation. It's just putting it onto an axis of a graph. And then it's taking and plotting that. Now, y equals mx plus b, very simple regression line. We've all learned that in, in basic algebra. Um, the models themselves get way more complex and add in way many more um, vertices and a lot more dimensions. But in the end, it's just a math problem. Right? It's coming down into a formula that you're plugging in 
for uh, each, of those, each of those features, and at the end it's telling you survived or did not survive. So what are the steps? How do we begin to do this? So we figured out, um, we have data set, we have a dependent variable, we have some, some outcomes that we want to predict, now what do we do? So first, we've, we have to get that data collected. So we get that data collected with that data engineer or data scientist or any other groups that are working with it together. Then you develop this model through iterations. You have all this data, you bring it in the model, and this is where that science part of data science comes. Because this isn't like, oh, well now we hit this, we need to go over and do this. This is more like, oh, I think that maybe if we add this feature, it'll get better. An example of this one I think is kind of cool. Um, there was a contest a few years ago to try and predict the most reliable used car, or to predict how, how reliable a used car was gonna be. Um, so they gave this huge data set and included like number of miles, the, the, uh, the color of the car, the type of the car, the make of the car, the model of the car, all that stuff. And then it also had information on how long it lasted afterwards. And so they said, okay, they'll build this model, right? And so all the teams were like, yeah, we have these features, we're gonna go build this model, I'm gonna tell you exactly what car you should buy. And then there was one team who didn't, who didn't build a lot, they talked a lot, they, they discussed on what they could do, and then they started building towards the end. And it was really cool because the team that ended up winning thought way outside the box in their future development. So they, they spent a lot of time developing this model and iterating through, thinking about the features. And what they realized was that the color of the car was one of the most important pieces of information that they were given. Has anybody heard this story before? Yeah. So what they found was that in their color set, orange cars were almost guaranteed to be better performers in the long run. And what it ended up boiling down to was that they added a feature into their machine learning model on if the color was stock or if the color was custom. And it makes sense to start to think about it because a stock color versus a custom color, someone paid extra for an orange car. I, I, I thought about this, I've never been to a lot and seen an orange car. Like they just don't make them off the line in orange. So that means that someone went and said, I care enough about my car, I want an orange one. And typically that means I'm gonna take care of my car because it's orange and I like it and I want it. And so really what their model came down to was looking outside that box in this developing model through iterations to be able to figure out that, oh, we need to think of a, of a feature that's a little outside that box and may have a huge impact on what we're doing. So don't rush through this. Spend some time developing the model. Then you're gonna go ahead and deploy that model, which means that you typically build an API over it or you um, integrate it into a, a phone, some sort of way for that, inter that model to interact with the application around it. And then you begin to monitor that performance and then you do this whole process again. Right? It's great that we got super accurate, but we can always be better. Um, more time, more resources, everything else. Um, and that's an example, maybe they started to look for other features outside of the color of the car being stock uh, to be able to solve that type of problem. But here's kind of what it looks like. Uh, let's say the second one of your examples. So uh, you give two examples, one with like a static model you build and forget it, another one where you continuously iterate on itself and learn more. Um, definitely the second, right? Um, Not learn adjust. Adjust. I think it also, it also becomes smarter and learns more in my idea. So like let's take Chipotle again. Chipotle had models of predicting customers, and then Chipotle had an E. coli outbreak. Uh, this happened, right? They had an outbreak and their customers dropped. So they're, they kept the same model of prediction, and never fed in that new data, um, they might not be around. Uh, but I'm sure that they, whether they had a model or some owner or something, they thought about that and became more predictive. So you need to be able to feed this back in so that the, the model can continue to learn on itself. Mm -hmm. But the supervised learning, it's basically depending on the feature set that you actually learn the algorithm from whatever the training set you're using, right? So whatever the model you get from the training set, you don't add more features to that. If you continue to use the same training set, now what if you use a new training set? 
So if you can add in a new training set or you continuously refresh your training set, and um, there's ways of doing this so that you can just you know, train your model every night, for example, on what happened the day before. Or use like a 30 day moving average of all of your features. Um, and that'll allow your model maybe not to drastically change, but it will tweak itself um, to be more accurate. So you have to get a priority to the data because It depends on your use case. In the Chipotle data, probably, if we go back to Chipotle, maybe they had um, in there, if they had a feature set for major news story, positive or negative, and all of a sudden that popped in, um, that can make a big drastic change on, on the, the influence there. Or like, it would probably have to be drastic news story in the last 30 days, because um, then you would see that each day kind of building on itself. But if you refresh that, and, and yeah, having new features also helps, but if that data itself is continuously refreshed, will help too. Mm -hmm. That's definitely not, the, there's an option there. I don't know exactly in this specific example on what size data set they were given and kind of how many, if orange cars was representative of the entire world, right? Because ideally, if you're giving a data set, maybe like one in 1,000 is an orange car. If there's a thousand, there's only one orange car, right? Um, I don't know where they were at on that, but the, the idea of that was that they thought outside the box and built a feature that wasn't originally there around like is, is the color custom or not, and it had a huge influence on the model. Uh, but you do have to follow, watch out for those traps, right? Uh, it's called overfitting, typically, is when you take a model and your training set is so defined that you overfit that model, and that model can't accurately predict because its training set is too precise and didn't give it a broad enough view of the world. Um, so you have to be aware of that as well as you go through these, but, but. And uh, because mm -hmm. some of those cases Demand what? Or continuous learning. I'm thinking of something like an email spam, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, people are getting smarter to spam. So your analytics or the data science also has to be continuously learning and adapting. So what is, how do we adapt to something like that? Or how do we adapt in, in this model? Yeah, so in this model, every time you def redefine and refine your business problem, you, you would your problem is still solving scam, but maybe you bring in new features or new data sets. And there's techniques to do that when you recompile your model. Um, and you re can recompile it on a frequency of which is appropriate for the problem you're trying to solve. Okay, can you build on top of the model? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can technically do whatever you want, right? This is just, it's just software. Um, so like many times models are related on other models. Um, and they use a feature from it. So like you had a model with a bunch of features. One of your features for a further model up the chain could be the answer from a lower model. So that that model, like how many burritos are going to be bought, could be dependent on the model of how many customers are coming in tomorrow. Um, if you're looking at burritos versus burrito bowls versus everything else is a bowl way. So yeah, that can definitely be the case. Um, Let me show you when we get to that. Okay. Um, but it just basically means like it is computer science, right? We're writing code to do this. Um, so like when you compile that code, it, it, it does create a model in the back end that is, is going to do that. It just comes down to math. Uh, but I want to get through some of this. Uh, yeah, yeah. One question I have uh, regarding this email spam thing. So let's say uh, one email is spam to you but not spam to me. Does it mean that model is user specific or are we trying to apply the same model? Yeah, so like you would have to have a user-specific model in that case. Um, and there's some good papers out there on how this works and how it's worked in the past, because like um, Gmail and Outlook have been doing spam boxes for years. Um, so it's pretty, it's a pretty robust problem on how to solve, or at least get started in solving. They obviously don't do a great job, so I still get spam in my inbox, and I'm sure everybody else does. Um, but there's models on how that show that, so it wouldn't have to be user-specific. But um, you might also have like a couple gateway, right, that are group specific. So like if you're at a college or university, um, 
maybe all the students in this university, maybe there's an attack that comes from spam that is going to all the university students about buying textbooks. Um, you might be a group, but you yourself might have other things that need to be there. So I would assume that for a, uh, a successful spam model, it would actually be many different layers of models that they would be using at different levels to be able to predict uh, which you would be interested in or not interested in. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's also data science. They're probably way more mature than what we're talking about with like uh, supervised learning. They're probably using some deep learning techniques. Um, I would assume numerous deep learning techniques, but they might be using a classification model to classify you for serving up ads. Um, so maybe they put you as a user, like me, they put me male under 30 living in Silicon Valley. Um, it's part of like a classifier that they've said that, oh, they all like ads at this way, and that's what they serve up to the advertisers. So that when I search at Google, some weird deep learning thing is telling me, here's the results you want to see about uh, whatever I'm searching for. And then maybe they also say, here's some ads that you'd like to see, because we've also recognized that you're in this group of people um, of similar demographics that you might want to do that. And I think that, that grouping, that classification model, um, would probably be used there. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, those are kind of, that's how you go through that. And now let's look, look at like how we actually do this, right? So we define that objective. We extract and analyze data. We do some pre-processing on that data because the data is never as clean as we want it to be. If you've worked in with data before, you know that like, this pre-processing box should just be the whole slide. And <laughs> that's where you spend a lot of your time is in the pre-processing. So we have the objective, we extract it, we process it. After that, we do our feature and target construction, so we start to build on that. Then here's where the actual model uh, building comes in, right? So now we have to take and train and test that data. Um, so what you typically do with data is you take it, pull it apart, training set, test set, and continue on with that. So with our, with our uh, test set, we take our feature selection, or sorry, our train. Um, we, we feature, we've got our feature selection, we train that model, and then we take and we take the ones that the model hasn't seen yet, we pull out the dependent variable, and we score that model. So that just means we take those, that data, put it back into the model, and outcome, as an outcome, we get um, information and predictions. And then we evaluate to see how we did. So totally what this looks like, and I'll even have the arrow in there, we have our objective, extract and analyze, pre-process, feature and target construction, we train and test the splits. If we're going to take uh, only a, a number of the features, we go ahead and take those apart, train the model, score the model, evaluate the model. Cool, are you with me? And then this is kind of how we go ahead and, and deploy that afterwards. We take the data, pre-process it, build our features, and then throw that into the model. I'll show both of these quickly in a, a quick demo of Azure Machine Learning, where we kind of drag and drop and build this whole process, like I was saying for the Titanic. Cool, so have you guys um, heard of Kaggle before? This is where this data set comes from. So Kaggle is a data science website where if you're learning how to do data science, tons of great resources. What they do is they do competitions, and their competitions range from just for fun to for big prizes. Like they had something on here for both Microsoft, AWS, and um, Facebook. If you solved and won the competition, the whole group that you were working with got the opportunity to go and interview with them for their data science team. 
So really cool stuff on here. Um, there's also some that are just like for money. So these change all the time. So this is for Bosch, production line performance. So if you, if you win this, I think probably the top three teams, you get $30,000. So huge financial incentive on the website to start to learn. And if you don't want to go against you know, the big leagues right away, there's some here just for knowledge. Uh, and typically they have some for like swag as well. Oh, here's one for jobs at Allstate. I should maybe do this. How severe is an insurance claim? <laughs> I know those data sets pretty well. Um, and then you can see also that all these here. Now I was talking about Titanic. This is the one we're going to go ahead and take a look at. And just basically predicting the survival on Titanic. Um, and they walk you through how to do this with R and Python and a number of different programs. I'm just going to show you how to do this with Azure Machine Learning, which is one of Microsoft's products. Um, here's the data that we're going to go ahead and use. I've already downloaded this and added some features just to save time. I don't want it to go too long. Um, so I pulled the train model and I pulled the, the test model down. Um, so what those look like are here. So you see we have a bunch of data, like passenger ID. Here's our important dependent variable. Did they survive? We have their class, their name. Um, gender, age, everything else here. Ticket, fare, cabin, embarked. I added a few features, um, pretty simple features, nothing too crazy, right? I said, um, let's just multiply age by class and see what happens, um, see if that has any influence on it. I also looked at the size of the family, and I looked at which deck they were staying on. So I added these three features as kind of my custom features. Um, there's many other ones that you can add, and you can get very complex with this. Um, but just for sake of a quick example, just pull out these three of them. So now I'm going to go back over to our machine learning portal. So it's already recognized me. I have a bunch of workspaces here. This is just uh, the landing page at studio.azureml.net. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and open up a recent workspace that I just created. So this pulls us into the studio itself, uh, where you can see that we have a bunch of projects, experiments, um, web services, etc. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with something brand new. Um, I'm going to do a blank experiment, but before I do that, if you're looking at how you can potentially learn a little more about data science, there are a number of samples here, right? Um, how, to, how to do cross for binary dot classification, um, how to look and do a regression for auto imports, how to do machine learning on visual um, letters, how to train against letters, a ton of different things here. Um, that if you wanted to see how this is happening and get a little bit more learning, you can go take a look at this. We're just going to start with a blank experiment. Pop this open. Call it the Titanic. And we want to use a data set from our computer. So we go ahead and upload this data set right here. That's Titanic test. It's not a new one. And it's just a CSV file there. So it's going to upload that data set. Um, I'm just going to use the last one so it takes a second to upload. Um, so I did, we want the training data here. And you can see that if we go ahead and visualize this, it should show us exactly what's in that data. Again, we have the passenger ID, the survive column, all the things that we would expect. See the deck, fare per person, and family size. Everything that we were just looking at. So. If we remember what was going on in the data science framework that I was showing before, the first thing we have to do is get that data so that there's no missing values and that it's clean. So let's look that up. There we go. Missing value scrubber. Here, and what this does is just goes ahead and replaces values with 0 and 1. Um, since this is just a quick model to show you how fast we can get something going, you know, you want to look at this a little bit differently, um, change everything. So that would fit what you were trying to solve for. But for this case, it's fine. We'll just keep moving on. So we do our missing value scrubber. And maybe you're using a model that can only take in a certain number of features, or you want to just know what your data set looks like. So we'll look at um, how you can do feature selection. So a cool piece about this is if you don't know what your data looks like or what to do, you can go ahead and just kind of bring in a feature selection. So we drag this over here. 
You can see that there's three of them. Um, if you need help in understanding what they do, you can click on this more help button and it takes you over to you know, a huge page of information on what exactly this is doing under the covers and when to use it, why to use it, everything else. So we're gonna to wanna to go ahead and launch this column selector and we want it to tell us what it's doing. Oh, I need to drag this in here. What we're interested in doing is figuring out what are the features that have the biggest influence on our dependent variable, which is survived. So we'll take survived, move it over here, go ahead. And now if I run this, oops, it's only gonna tell us the, the one feature that's most important. I wanted to check it, check it to be a couple, couple more than just one. But you can make this show how many features, the top, the top five, top 10, top 20 features that are actually um, changing what's going on in our, um, yep, so here's the number of features. So let's just change this to five and run this again. So now we'll get back at the top five um, columns or features that have the most influence on whether they survived or not. Uh, depends on the type of feature selector you're using, um, but yeah, there's more computations involved. Um, it, might, it, it depends on the one that you choose. Um, but here you can see this, you have your class, fair, fair per person, age and class. So these are two of the ones that, that I made quickly are in the top five features, so we're onto something, right? Um, this, is a good, this is a good way to go back and forth and see, you know, are, are the features we're making really worthwhile? For the model we're gonna build, we're just gonna use all the features, so we'll go ahead and delete that. But I thought it was kind of cool to highlight um, if you're a little lost there. So missing value discover. Next, we need to split the data, right? Because we're gonna go and start training and testing our model. The fraction of the rows you use in your training data and test set, everyone's gonna disagree on. I like 70 in the training set, 30 in the test set, just personal preference. Um, but everyone has a different opinion on, on what is correct there. So this is a split data. So this is like, uh, we have all the data we have, these like eight, that's like 500 rows or something. And I want to pull them apart to look at some for training my model and some for testing my model. Um, I do 70, 30, as people like 80, 20. It's all about looking out for overfitting. Um, but I think that 70, in this case, should be fine. Um, so we go ahead and split that out, and then we're going to want to train our model. So we pull this out, we train our model, we pull our, we pull our split data, this is our 70% of our data, into here. We launch our column selector, and we do survive again. So now we're training the model on survived. This is where I think it's kind of cool, because we can look at, um, we recognize this earlier as a classification problem. So as we go into machine learning, we can look at um, initializing our model. You see that we have all the different classes shown here. We said it was a classification model. Okay, so now we're well on our way to finding out which algorithm might be best for this. Um, there are all these classification algorithms, maybe we can just try some here to see how they perform. So let's just start out with a um, two-class boosted decision tree, because I like, I like those. So we drag it over, we train our model, and next we want to do is we want to see, okay, how does our model do? Let's score it. Go ahead and we take this, train model down here. We bring our holdback data set to see how it does into our score model. And then after we score our model, we're going to want to evaluate it. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. So now what it's doing in the back end is it's going through and it's actually running this pipeline for us. So we just created a data pipeline um, that is all gonna go back on Azure in the back end and go ahead and run and calculate all this for us. Um, so you see that we've now split the data. We have our two class misuse of decision tree. It's currently training the model. So it's going in there and having the model learn about what it's doing. And now we'll go ahead and score that model so that we can start to see how that model performs. Once that model has been scored, which means that it's going to add whether the model thought that people survived or did not survive into the actual data, 
Then we're going to toss the evaluation on top of it so we get a pretty graph. Because everybody likes graphs. So let's take a look at what happened here. Let's get this out of the way. Go away. Score model. Let me visualize this. It's going to be a little hard to see, but you can see here that we have our survived. So we have 0, 1, 1. Now if we go all the way over here, we'll see that we have our score probabilities and whether they um, survived or not. You can see 0, 1, 1. Let's see if we can find one where they didn't. 0, 0, 0. 1, 1, 0. Oh, okay, so here. This one, um, Mr. Eric, male 32. Our model thought that um, he did not survive, but he in fact did survive. So you can see the model is not perfect, because we just built it uh, on stage here. And what is it, like 10 minutes? Um, so it's not per perfect, but that's okay. So let's take a look at our evaluate and take a look at this. Um, this is going to show you the, the ROC. Um, what we're going to take a look at here is just where we're at, um, our area under the curve. That's what we're going to use in this example as our, um, our gauge on how our model is doing. The other important thing to look at here um, is the true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative stats. Um, if you don't know what these are, true positive means that in this case um, someone died and we correctly thought that they did. Uh, true negative is someone didn't die, they actually didn't die. Uh, false positive would be that someone was said to have survived but they actually died. And a false negative is that uh, the opposite there. So depending on what you're predicting, these four things can be very important. Something like this where it's a little uh, taboo to be saying, oh, you know, I'm sorry so and so but they just didn't make it. That you need to be very careful on, on if you are saying those things. So these are very important to model that to be very correct. Um, but in our Chipotle model, a uh, little more leeway on if we think someone's going to buy a burrito and they accidentally buy a salad. And it's a little different, right? So just keep those in mind. It's cool numbers that you can see there. There's a ton of other things you can learn on here about um, what, uh, how, how, how well this model is doing. Question Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people do, um, and you can put this in a nice GUI. One of the things that you get out of this, um, here is we have like Python. So if you want to put a Python script, you want to build your whole model there, you can do that. Um, you want to do all the data, everything that you wanted to, you can easily do that in a Python script. Um, same thing with... Can you import MATLAB or Yep. Well, you can't, I don't think you can, but you can do R. Um, I don't think, I don't... Is MATLAB open source? Uh, no. Yeah, so that, so like you can do the same thing as like an R script. You can do execute R script. Um, open CV if you want to do image processing. There's a number of things um, that you can upload and they're constantly changing. Um, I don't know if you can upload MATLAB or Octave specifically, uh, but I know that we were going kind of like an open source first approach. And so that's what we're able to do there. But the, the cool thing now uh, that we can take a look at, we, so we did one with the boosted decision tree. This is where like kind of having the cloud behind this is kind of cool because what we can do here is I'm just going to do this. And bear with me because it's going to get a little bit messy. I'll have to do this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to train the model side by side here using the same data set and everything else. I'm going to score that same model, and we can compare them right away to see which one's better. So this is where when I was saying um, it is interesting if you are not sure which model to use because now it becomes very easy to try multiple models. So if we go back to classification, and this time we're going to try a two-class decision jungle, we'll be able to see which one performs better. Again, same column selector. We also want to look at survived here as what we're predicting on. I have to click OK.
And now if we run that, it'll run these two models side by side. Um, and this will be able to tell us, like, oh, maybe we want to tweak some things, we want to look at what different pieces do. And these could both be the same exact um, algorithm underneath the covers, but maybe you're tweaking some of the um, model parameters. Um, so maybe like you want to look at how many, in the decision tree, like how many, how many times do you want to, how deep do you want to go in that tree um, to make the prediction. So that's kind of cool because you can iterate over this over and over again very quickly uh, depending on the size of your data set. And as you can see, like this is, this is going pretty fast. So now we can take a look at the evaluation of the model. And we can take a look here. So this is uh, on our left side, the scored data set. Our area under the curve is uh, 0.838. And our scored data set, to compare, 0.854. So in this like very quick thing, we want to pull the one from the right. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that. So we have our trained model here. I'm going to go ahead and save this as a trained model. And our name from this is on stage demo model. Cool, so we go ahead and save this model. So what, what is cool now is I can go ahead and I can go back and I can create a new experiment now using that model and exposing that via an API. Um, so let's do this TANIC API model. And so I've also created some of the um, test data. So this is the same test data. I'm just going to pull this over here. And I just remember, again, just got this here from this test. I added my three features that we needed in order to have the model work. Now if I visualize this, let's just make sure that those are there. Again, age, family size, deck. What we're interested in doing here is cleaning, cleaning our missing data. on all of our columns. And this is a cool little hack that we can do here. Since we want to get this data back and we're giving it um, the data that we want to see, so it's not necessarily going to be API driven, we can take this data and we can go ahead and score the model here against the um, actual trained model. So if I go ahead like this and I score the model here, when we see what happens on this side, we should see what comes out are um, the data that we put in, which doesn't have a survived column, and then the predictions from our, our model on whether they survive or not. I'll get, I'll get to that. I, I, I misspoke a little bit earlier. I'll show you where the API comes as soon as I, as soon as I drive this out. Let me try and have this new data set. It's mad because the uh, the data is doesn't have the same features. And that just might be I might have um, named them differently, which would have been silly on my part. But let's see if that is in fact the case. So what I'm trying to get to here is that Kaggle, the way that they expect the data to look, is they expect it to be um, just the passenger ID and whether they survived or not. So I want to get that in the CSV format so that we can upload that to see how we ranked on Kaggle. Uh, we won't rank very high, but it'll be uh, kind of that full process so you can see how you could do this on your own. Okay, so save data sets. I just did this as the Titanic pre-test. Visualizing this again, age of class, family size, stack, 
clean, run it, and see what happens. So I'm in the free version right now. Um, you get it for eight hours for free. The way that the, the costs are computated is that for each API call you are calling into this, which I haven't shown yet, uh, it costs like a, a penny or two. And then you also have computational um, hours that are being logged in the back end on this. So like when we press play and it spins and then comes out in green, um, there are some costs associated with playing through that. Um, so you get to this using the Azure portal, but it is it is independent, yeah. All right, for some reason it's not working, so I'm going to move over to one of the ones I had prepared um, in the beginning. Just doing the same thing, it's scoring, so it's, you see that it scores the model, um, and then from that scored model, if we take a look at this, we visualize this. We'll see that we have our passenger ID here, and then also our score label and probability, saying that we think that person survived or did not survive. Some of the things that I add on top of that here are project columns, because I just am only interested in those two columns, survived and passenger ID. A metadata editor to change the name of the column to survives that I accepted in Kaggle, and then I convert that to CSV. So now what I want to do is I want to download the CSV, see that it has gone over there, so now I go into here and make a submission. I have 10 injuries. So let's see. Go to downloads. Create that Titanic experiment. Go ahead and submit that. And now that should be thinking for a little bit. It'll come up to that public leaderboard. As that's thinking, it takes a while. I'm going to show you kind of how you would set up a web service to work on top of this. Super easy. You click set up web service. And then what you'll see that it do, did is it takes a web service input and it adds this in here. So uh, your web service input would go in like this. Yep, so your web service input is the data structure that you're expecting to send it through via the REST API. Mm -hmm. so, and then you can see here, so this isn't my best score that I've gotten before. Oh no, go back. <laughs> One more time. Dave, you're not from Texas, are you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So we look at the deploy the web service. Um, I gotta run this again. All right, Kaggle's a little slow. Um, I'm going to have both these open. So this is running. Afterwards, we'll go ahead and deploy that web service. And all it's doing is saying, here's the data that you expect to come with the web service. And then builds an API on top of that that you can interact with. And then it gives back the predictions to you. Um, and we'll see once we do this, it does a lot of cool stuff with giving you example code to build this in really quick and kind of um, giving you an opportunity to test it and do both um, single predictions as well as batch predictions. Yep. Yeah, I, I was I'm definitely skewing the data. Um, yeah, there's there's options when you do this clean missing, you can do missing value, um, and you can also set this as a parameter, so you could come in as a parameter. Um, or if you in this one, you wouldn't be able to change the columns to A and to D. Um, 
Well, you just you could just use you could use a Python script to do it. So just do it in Python and throw in a Python that looks at run everything through this and then clean out the A and the D for that. Uh, so that'd be some custom code that you have to implement there. Or you'd have to change your A B C D to like one two three four, um, and use some sort of numbers, and then you could use this module. Alright, so I've deployed the web service. Classic. As that's thinking, here's, here's the entry we got, right? So, um, 3,400 in second place. So, we're not going to win any money, but luckily there's no money on the line for this one. Um, but you can see that we did a lot better than, you know, quite a few other people. So some there are, um, you know, 5,582 people um, that have predicted this, and actually getting it all wrong is a pretty good feat as well. <laughs> but um, maybe that's what they were shooting for. Um, but yeah, so you can see that like that was pretty easy to, to go ahead and do that there. Now let's see if this will run here. features because uh, we were so far in like the, the middle slash lower part of the pack that is probably they use other features. As you get into the higher areas of the competition, say like the top hundred, it's more because they tweak their model to be better. Okay, so now we've seen now we have our our um, Titanic experiment API. So this is build an API on top of that. Um, and you can see that this has an API key that you'd actually go ahead and put in there. Yeah? Is there a way to automate the tweaking process itself in all the machine language or uh, in machine learning for what you're trying to do is to try and get the model predicted using machine learning? Yeah, there's a lot of companies that try and do that. Um, it's kind of hard to just generalize it. For some opportunities, you could, but a lot of times, because there is that business problem you're trying to solve, there's always a trade off between like, do we want it to be 100% or do we want, do we want, do we want it to be like 95% and make 5% really bad decisions? Or do we want it to make 80% and only make good decisions? So like, you can, but only to a point. And it's really hard to generalize. So there are companies trying to do it. Um, I just don't know how successful they're gonna be. Yeah, so then we built this API over top, um, and you can see that these rest, it gives a bunch of API documentation for this experiment. And you can see that it just post up into our uh, endpoint here, and um, you'll get a, a response back. So you can see that we give um, a number of sample code here, C Sharp, Python, and R, since those are like kind of the three languages that most people are using to interact with Azure Machine Learning. <laughs> But it's an API. Uh, you can write this in JavaScript, in any, any language that you would like, because it's just an API. Right? You just send data up and you get it back. So then if we just take a look at the um, experiment itself, you'll see that that's been deployed. Um, and, and we're able to, to hit that using um, the endpoint here. So I don't have a whole experiment on how to build that endpoint and stuff, because it would have just taken too much time. I think I'm already over time by a few minutes. Um, so that's what I had today, kind of showing you how um, you can become a data scientist using a tool like Azure Machine Learning to be able to experiment and train and try new models and new techniques um, and get real-time instant feedback. Um, so I've been I've people been asking questions. I've been answering along this way, but if you guys have other questions, uh, now's your time to ask them, or I'll be around afterwards. It's all personal preference. I mean, TensorFlow is like a a, a, a directed analytical graph, a little different um, in the problems that it'll solve, um, and it's definitely not as user friendly. Um, so yeah.
they're all they're all different, and people can use whatever one they find uh, most fitting. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not a data scientist, like um, I, I was doing a little different of a function, so I was um, making sure that data scientists could use this platform, but um, a data scientist might write some models, they might get some data, they might go to some meetings to figure out what the application is going to look like, um, so it's a very varied day. I would say that they're not always working specifically in this, use, this, this space. Okay, uh, we take one more question. Go ahead. What, what exactly did you upload to Kaggle? Did you upload the models or the Just the output. Um, so what I, what, I did to, what I put into Kaggle was just um, the CSV file here. Uh, I'll download it again and open it. Just the Titanic and all it has in here is the passenger ID and whether they survived or not. Uh, and that's just, that's just defined by Kaggle on what they wanted to see in there. So they don't have any hidden data that they test against our home? Uh, the data that they give you is, is in there. So I don't know whether these people survived or not. Um, they just give me the data without that, without that feature in it, without like that, that column. Um, and so then the model is tested because the only they have the answer key. Yeah, so they, this, there's, they give you a little over, th probably 1,300 or so, um, and 900 or so of them are for test. Cool. Okay, folks. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Okay, for sticking around.